Coming up on the DMT One to One Show, episode 61, on the 22nd of May 2014, an interview with Jeremy Silver, author of Digital Medieval. It's a real pleasure to welcome to the show today Jeremy Silver as we're going to chat about uh, your new book called Digital Medieval, the first 20 years of music on the web. So hi Jeremy and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Hi Andres. Great. Good to be here. So it's a pleasure to have you and uh, Jeremy as a means of introduction for listeners of the show that uh, haven't heard about Jeremy before. He has been involved in the music industry for the past 20 years, uh, starting at 19, in 1992 at Virgin Records as Director of Media Affairs, then becoming Vice President of New Media, getting the first taste of the internet, then moving on to shape EMI's global digital strategy. You also worked uh, at a music startup called Uplister for a time uh, during the dot-com boom and bust of the two early 2000s. You were the CEO of the Featured Artist Coalition for a time and also the CEO of Sibelius Software. And uh, you're currently Executive Chairman at Symmetric and Shared Music Glue. So lots of stuff going on here, Jeremy, and, and it's great talking to you today. And, uh, first of all, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the title of the book, Digital Medieval. Uh, what spurred you to write the book and where does the title come from? So uh, I, I, I decided that it was worth trying to document uh, all the extraordinary things that happened in this period of, the, of, of 20 years. It feels like 20 years of the web sounds like an immense amount of time, and yet in a way, you know, the amount of things that have gone on in that period um, are far larger and far more than anyone could have imagined, I guess. And uh, but at the same time, uh, I have that strong feeling that in lots of ways, we're just at the beginning of all of this. Right. And so uh, the, the medieval idea was really all about uh, that sense of it being, you know, we're still in the dark ages, we're still feeling our way. And actually, of course, the, the medieval period was a period of great innovation, uh, uh, as well as one of, uh, of chaos and strife. And uh, that seemed in lots of ways to, to sum up uh, the kind of what we've experienced with music on the web. And uh, there was a, a lot of uh, ways in which the old rules and the, the simple ways in which things had worked before and the, the clarity of, uh, uh, of the church governing uh, the Western of Europe uh, was all disintegrating right. and the rules were all changing. And actually, when you think about, you know, music on the web, it, all the rules have changed all the time, and in lots of ways, uh, not just around music, actually broadly as well, there's that feeling um, that actually people are making up new ways of doing business all the time now, yeah. and, still, and still doing that. Yeah, of course. And, uh, and so um, uh, tell us a little bit about the companies that uh, you feel are the center of this uh, digital medieval period and, and, and how they are shaping the reality that we live in. Well, I think that, you know, when you, the, the obvious big players for us today have become uh, giants in the landscape. And, and really, when you think about the role that, that Google and Facebook and Amazon and Apple between them play, and I would say those four companies, uh, there are others as well, Twitter and Yahoo and so on. But it, I think if we just look at those four companies, they really are dominating the landscape. They're influencing the ways in which people are doing business. They're creating platforms around which whole ecosystems of businesses are being built. And uh, I, I, again, without wanting to push the medieval metaphor too far, it does strike me that there's a really interesting analogy there where these uh, the business models of these companies are all about trying to pull consumers in, all about, uh, if you like, a walled garden approach, right. uh, which, which, is, which is really about um, making sure that once we're involved in their, on their particular platform that it becomes increasingly attractive to stay there and more and more difficult to leave. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that is, uh, uh, so, you know, what starts off as a walled garden is eventually becomes more like a city-state. Sure. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, with, with Amazon and with Apple in particular, we're kind of really um, increasingly seeing ourselves drawn into being, you know, an Apple kind of a person or an Amazon kind of person. And, and actually, it becomes more and more difficult to be agnostic. And uh, I was looking at uh, sort of the, the companies that, uh, of course, uh, are at the core of this revolution uh, uh, in the book. And uh, w one thing that struck me is the fact that a lot of them, uh, or all of them actually, uh, are uh, Western in origin. So uh, on, the, on, on a globalized playing field, how do you see uh, countries like China and, uh, and India coming into, in, onto the Internet with the vag vagnance now? Uh, like, how do you see India and China shape uh, how these companies, for, for example, are going to operate? And uh, uh, will we see new players coming from developing? countries uh, uh, that might disrupt this pattern that, that we're seeing right now in the West? 
Well, I think um, it, certainly in China, there are companies like Weibei and like Tencent that are analogous to these giants in uh, in the West. And because of the political situation and because of the sort of technological Great Wall firewall of China that's been set up, in some respects, there is a, a you know a different kind of environment in China. Yeah. But but equally, uh, we still are seeing some big giant players who uh, are, are pulling in very large numbers of consumers and then creating environments in which smaller businesses actually work, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a kind of uh, dependent relationship with those, those large companies. Absolutely. And, I think that's, and I think that's the thing that's, that's interesting about it. When you think about it from a music point of view, and then you look at what's going on in the landscape as a whole, what you kind of start to see is the way in which uh, actually artists and then independent labels and then the majors represent a kind of structure and a set of relationships, which is not dissimilar to what we then see writ large in the broader landscape of, of startup companies and big tech players. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and so uh, India actually is a very different uh, uh, country than China, put them together. But of course, India is different in the sense that with over a billion people, it doesn't have anywhere near the uh, you know, technological infrastructure that China has to produce those large companies. And so actually uh, companies like Google are doing very well there. And so maybe we're going to see a homogenization a little bit of, of the landscape on that front, in spite of there being some local companies that are trying to, uh, to make some inroads in the industry. And uh, I wanted to go a little bit back uh, uh, on, on the history, sort of uh, uh, rewind the clock a little bit and uh, uh, talk about uh, your start at Virgin. So, uh, you know, Virgin was uh, where you first sort of got your taste of the internet and, and how things were uh, working on that front. So, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, when you realized that the web was going to be a thing and, and what you did at Virgin about it. Oh, well, I, you know, I mean, the internet was there for quite a long time before the web came along, of course. And, um, you know, the the very beginning of the web, actually, there was very little that you could go and see. There was new websites. So, <laughs> um, and actually, I mean, in that so true for a lot of people, uh, what we're finding is that the that people made promotional activities. So the reason why you built a website was not because you thought that lots of people were going to come to the website or in, download the music or engage with the bands. The reason why people would come to these websites is because basically they were journalists and news reporters who were writing about this cool stuff that, that was going on and that actually the value for the, for the artist or for the label was in the promotional coverage that it got in the old media, not the value of the new media itself. So, it, it, you know, that's obviously, that's changed hugely in some respects yeah. but in other other ways interestingly it's still there in as much as people still want to glom on to the latest thing they still want to use uh you know whether it's the new virtual reality kind of idea or whether it's high definition music audio or whether it's uh, uh you know 3d printing or whatever it might be the current thing is still something that artists like to be associated with because it generates publicity yeah so there is an interesting kind of uh relationship there yeah absolutely so so i guess you know the the, the way that you justified spending a budget on on being online at the beginning was for that uh, pr effect right yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 nobody thought that we were going there because we were going to create a whole new audience. Everyone thought that was completely insane. And the idea that people would watch anything on, on the internet rather than watching it on TV was completely nuts, obviously. Whereas, you know, where, where, where we are now is is completely the other way around. Exactly. And so uh, uh, the industry, of course, uh, has experienced a number of failures <laughs> over, uh, you know, sort of the uh, late uh, 90s, early 2000s when it came to dealing with how uh, the landscape was evolving. Uh, one of the uh, most uh, glaring ones, but actually one of the least known, uh, I think, as a popular culture uh, uh, kind of thing, uh, is the failure of uh, SDMI, the Secure Digital Music Initiative. So can you explain uh, what SDMI was and why that failure was significant for the industry? SDMI was a was a grand plan uh, that, in lots of ways, uh, kind of encapsulated all the ideals of the the major uh, labels and the music executives running them at the time. Uh, the idea was to engage on a grand scale all of the consumer electronics companies, the IT companies, the infrastructure companies. Uh, 
all together uh, in a, a, an agreement around an architecture that would essentially create a regulated and controlled version of the internet right. across which music could flow in a controlled fashion um, and value could be captured. And uh, actually, you know, in lots of ways, its aspiration and its uh, scale of vision was extraordinary and has never really been uh, attempted to be repeated. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think it's something that in years afterwards, people have kind of derided it and said it was crazy and said all these guys were smoking crack. But actually, you know, that what that... that and I think they probably were, to be honest, because they had, I think there was such a failure to understand the fact that even while they were sitting around uh, in high quality conference halls in glamorous venues uh, in different countries around the world, um, the MP3 horses had already bolted and were charging off across the plane, you know. So yeah. uh, it, <laughs> it, it was a great idea and had a great vision. Um, and I think that there are still... Uh, executives out there who would love to see that become obtainable and and I think some of the attempts at legislation that we've seen uh, have continued in that same vein which is all about you know attempting to control and centralize uh, the way in which music and ultimately all content gets distributed across the web and it's interesting to talk about uh, you know an initiative that failed that was trying to bring the industry together and, and come up with a few resolutions around uh, uh, the way things were being done online. And uh, but one of the problems you highlight is the fact that the industry is always trying to renovate old structures rather than innovating entire new processes. So uh, do you think that's the reason why SDMI failed, and also the reason why a project that makes complete sense from a, a, you know a theoretical and rational point of view, like the Global Repertoire Database? Uh, Seems to be hitting some roadblocks and it's not able to move forward at, at the moment. Well, I think when you look at something like SDMI, the lessons that you can learn from a project like that were all about um, the, the alignment or, or ultimately the non-alignment of business models. So the fact was that uh, the music industry believed that it could in some way or other persuade all of these other very large industry sectors that they could formulate around a common business model that would be in all of their interests. Yeah. And in the end, it became pretty apparent that that simply wasn't the case. And that, you know, that when you, and, and when you start to add the, you know, mobile dimension to in, into it, which at the time was, was much smaller, but has now obviously become very dominant, uh, that became even more apparent and even more obvious. And the, the, but there were the seeds in there of things that have worked. So if you look today at the way in which Spotify and Deezer and Beats have actually grown their own market share very quickly, it's by, particularly by doing deals with telcos yeah. and by bundling their product inside mobile operators. And, uh, Essentially, what they've done in those sorts of deals is found a way of aligning their business models in such a way that the, both parties were motivated to, to participate. And obviously, there's been a bunch of full starts along the way, and SDMI was the was the first grandest of those. But then we saw, you know, Nokia comes with music was another attempt to try and do that. Uh, and finally, it looks as if these this new sort of model. We'll see, but it looks like it might be working for these guys. But uh, mind you, you know, we've still got some way to go. Yeah, sure. And uh, uh, talking about uh, the way in which rights were handled uh, for the most part of the 2000s and also through to today, even though the situation is improving considerably, um, when you talk about the experience with Uplister, it's... Uh, uh, painfully obvious uh, what the problems were and uh, still are uh, to a certain extent within the, the industry when it comes to uh, startups that want to license music for use in, in a new uh, in a new way essentially so uh, you know it was very obvious how much a balance when you were trying to get a company off the ground you know the company's idea of course uh, and the staff were super important in getting the funding but then the market conditions and the willingness of investors to gamble on that idea was also equally important and of course the dot-com bust was a real problem for all startups that had good ideas but weren't able to get uh, further funding to, to keep them going. Uh, plus the location of the startup is paramount, you know, of course being in Silicon Valley or uh, today here in London or Berlin in, in some of the hubs uh, of, of, of startups is definitely helpful. And also uh, finally and most importantly for a music startup is, is the conditions of licensing and what kind of license the company needs uh, and uh, whether rights holders were willing to negotiate uh, reasonable conditions. And so uh, you know, today things seem to have changed a lot and, and uh, uh, record labels realize that it's no longer a case of making a hit and run with a startup and getting as much advance as possible and then or as much equity as possible and then running with it. Uh, 
but still there are still issues when it comes to small startups uh, trying to license music that are to do with just the generic uh, licensing landscape for music so how do you see that evolve uh, and uh, and what kind of lessons can we learn from you know from your listener experience that are still sort of worrying problems that are happening today i, I think the, the thing that's interesting is that the um, the, the kind of circumstances under which music are licensed today in the industry have evolved to this point because the, the subdivision of rights uh, historically has always reserved the industry well. Yeah. So it's the, the reason why there are so many different permutations of rights and so many different elements that have to be uh, put together in order to get a complete license in order to run a service, particularly the, the, you know, the publishing and the recording rights together. Um, is very much a matter of, of, of history uh, and, and of value. But uh, actually today, it almost is beginning to look as if it might actually mitigate against that value. In other words, that, that, that it's now so painful and so complex still to license music uh, that actually that, that may actually work against uh, the people who own the content because uh, licensing becomes too difficult. So, you know, the, 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 the obvious example of that is the lack of uh, Pandora's inability to establish itself in Europe because of the complexity of trying to establish licenses in 30 different territories in Europe. Um, having said that, I, I do think that we, we're seeing the majors being more receptive to new models, not simply putting roadblocks in the way of something they've never seen before, but taking a genuine and active interest in trying to understand how another model might work and how people might find value in music again. And clearly, we need to do that, and we've got to keep on doing that. And that openness to, uh, to experiment uh, has to continue to grow um, because uh, we're still, I think, uh, have not necessarily reached the end game here. You know, I, I, we've moved from the download model to the streaming model. Everybody's now convinced that streaming is where it's at and downloading isn't. And yet, at the same time, we all understand that there is immense complexity in the streaming model, uh, particularly based on subscriptions, uh, that the artist side of things is, is very unclear, uh, that the way in which labels divide up the royalty streams and so on is, is, is not easy to understand. And... Uh, the complexity of, of online and offline plays, of cached, non-cached, uh, multiple streams, uh, uh, the, the variation in the effective price, the numbers of people subscribing in any one accounting period is so complex that very few people have really got their heads around what that actually means, let alone how to really monetize it properly. So I, 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 I think that we are, we will see new models for selling music, that we're not done yet, uh, um, and that we will have to keep circling around and keep working this out. And so we, we've, the licensing uh, has to get more flexible and more friction free than it is, uh, not less so. Yeah, um, yeah. absolutely. Uh, you know, there's loads of uh, interesting episodes uh, that are, uh, uh, you know, narrated in the book. Uh, so definitely uh, worth uh, checking it out and and and, uh, and reading it uh, reading it all. But one of the things that uh, I found particularly fascinating was your account of the FAC meeting at Air Studios uh, and a particularly telling and fascinating episode around the inner working of the artist community. So can you tell us a little bit about that and also about uh, how you feel the artist community's role within negotiations uh, and their weight is changing? Uh, across the industry well you know as the shift in revenues has has moved away from recording and towards live from an artist's point of view uh, then campaigns uh, have become more and more centered around the artist and yet at the same time uh, artists still don't really feel as empowered as you would have thought that that change would have created and uh, and there are lots of reasons for that and there are lots of uh, different flavors uh, I mean, that, that, that particular occasion that you made earlier uh, was at the height of the debates around file sharing when the Digital Economy Act was being pushed through Parliament in the UK. And the artist community was really divided. So there were those people who felt really, really strongly that their rights needed to be protected, that, that online piracy was... was uh, uh, an outrage was a betrayal, was something that had to be stopped at any cost, and that there should be no barriers to uh, imposing penalties on consumers and on fans who file shared in that way. And there were equally artists who felt 
passionately the opposite, that actually it was the technology that was enabling it, that whatever you tried to do, you couldn't really stop it, that you shouldn't be penalizing the fans, you should be penalizing the infrastructure operators or the, or the, or the technology operators, but not the fans themselves. And there was this real tension and uh, real passion because the one thing that you always get from artists is emotion and passion that comes into these arguments, right? And, uh, uh, very often that, um, you know, that's, uh, that's incredibly difficult to handle and to manage because it clouds all the issues. And so we had, you know, uh, Lily Allen spilling wine and uh, staggering around the room, smoking and, and, and in, in one minute laughing and the next minute in tears as this debate went on. And we had Billy Bragg standing on a chair, brandishing his magic markers and his felt tip pens, trying to draw pictures on a whiteboard that, that you know, the, the kind of, uh, it was just a crazy scene. And I, I was bizarrely <laughs> found myself in the middle of this trying to manage these guys. And there was, you know, Nick Mason from Pink Floyd sitting there like a kind of wise sage and no one could tell what he was thinking at all. And Ed O'Brien from Radiohead kind of stroking his beard and sort of thinking, yeah, this is interesting, but I don't know what I think. David Arnold, you know, who did the Bond movies, was like stomping his feet, furious that this was going on. And uh, I mean, there was, there was Crispin, uh, who is, uh, you know, from The Long Pigs, uh, Crispin Hall, who just stopped out and said, you guys are all insane. I'm not even going to take part in this anymore. And it was just, it was surreal. You know, George Michael apparently was in the <laughs> mastering suite upstairs and had a runner going up and down to try and find out what was going on because this thing was so crazy. And I didn't know how we were going to get to an end. Uh, the amazing thing was, though, that, that actually when you put a bunch of artists together in a room like that, the last thing they actually want to do is fight. So the 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 what happened was that this kind of compromise came about and the, you know the debate was really about well what do you do or what's what sort of remedies are there and should you cut off people's internet access or could you you know what else can you do and in the end the the, the they came out with this idea of that you could slow someone's connection. You could squeeze the pipe down so they could still do their email uh, and they could still get online and they could even maybe download, but it'd be incredibly slow and that that would be a good punishment for them. Uh, <laughs> and that was the compromise we came out with. And everyone was just hysterically happy that we'd managed to reach this compromise as a result. <laughs> That's funny, and uh, you know, you touch upon copyright law in the book and the potential need to review it, both in the EU and the and the US. So, in that sense, what do you think right now are the most glaring problems with the current systems? And I know, you know, for example, we've seen some uh, some calls uh, from the Hado PE agency in France to review the DMCA style process, and I know the same things are uh, being uh, talked about in the states. So what do you think are the most glaring problems with uh, the copyright law in 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 both uh, uh, these uh, areas? regions uh, that should be addressed really well I, I, the thing is that there are there are the practical realities of what technology has done which it's very very hard to undo and fundamentally what technology has done has made it impossible to control the reproduction of music or of content any other digital content you can you can suppress it uh, you can make it more difficult, but you cannot control it. Uh, the reality is, if you and I can hear each other through a digital device, then we can record that output. And, th and that's, the, that's the bottom line, and you ain't going to change that. So from, from a very uh, idealistic point of view, I think one has to ask the question, if you have a body of law that is based on the ability to control the reproduction of a work, and you have a reality in the real world that says actually you can't control it, then there is a something fundamentally wrong with that law that needs to be addressed. And it's as, it's as simple as that, and it's also as, as enormous and as categorically difficult as that. And so I've, uh, you know, I've in, from time to time I've engaged to a greater or lesser degree in the debates around this and attempting to try and help policy development to the, in a way that would deal practically with what we, what we face here. But I have to confess that for the most part, uh, when you really sit down and talk with politicians about this topic, they all want to run a mile. Uh, you know, of all the topics, of all the possible vote-winning vote topics that a politician might want to engage in, this is not one of them. And so I, I, I'm not a great optimist about the chances of our really realistically reforming copyright in such a way, and, and constructively, that it could actually provide a new framework for providing value back to artists and creators. Uh, and yet I think ultimately that's what we will have to get to. And so 
uh, that's another reason why we might now be in the digital medieval period and maybe at some point in the digital renaissance that we'll get to that kind of copyright reform. But at the moment, I think it's, uh, uh, it is so thorny an issue and the lobbying is so hard from the entertainment industry, understandably, but at the same time in a way that doesn't help move the agenda forward. So yeah. I, I think... Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of challenges still to go there. Absolutely, and I think it's testament of that fact that, you know, last year I was uh, interviewing a prominent uh, member of the administration in the States, and I was prepped by four people who were very, very concerned about wording when it came to copyright review and reform and all that kind of stuff. So it definitely shows you the concern <laughs> around. <laughs> yes. I mean, even today, actually, you know, right now in the UK, um, we're looking at the reform of some of the revisions around co private copying, yeah. which, which frankly, private copying is legal in the US, but it has never been legal in the UK, even though every single person who has a digital device copies privately on a daily basis, uh, trying to agree what the wording of the law will be uh, in order to accommodate that, that just that simple reform, uh, which it doesn't necessarily change anything, but, you know, because of the, the this you know, heavily legalistic view that everyone takes of the heavy lobbying that goes through it and this obsession with the precedents that may be set all for very understandable reasons. Yeah. It just makes it very hard to see how things will move forward constructively. Yeah. And uh, looking at uh, uh, the way in which uh, the digital medieval period, as you describe it in the book, affects consumers. So do, what do you think uh, is consumers' perception right now? Because uh, in a sense, uh, I think... Uh, for the most part, consumers feel fairly free now uh, within different ecosystems and, and they only find that they're locked in when they try to do something that is not in their ordinary routine, I guess. So how, how do you think that's going to progress and uh, are consumers going to come to a halt when they realize that some things just can't happen and that is really locking them into specific systems? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a funny kind of... Um uh, naivety that exists amongst consumers, and maybe it's willful naivety, I don't know, but uh, certainly that, you know, the fact is that, that we are in a, in a data-driven uh, environment now, where the value of consumers is all about the data that they contribute back to the businesses that they transact with. And mostly, that is not on the surface, and mostly in our contractual relations with Google, or with Facebook, uh, or with Amazon, uh, what we think we're doing and what we're actually doing uh, in terms of a business transaction are not necessarily the same thing at all. So uh, that's not so much about the, the, the direct purchase of something. It's more about our activity, our, 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 tran our transaction, our engagement with content within the platforms that those are operated by those guys. Yeah. And, and uh, obviously, there's a much broader question here about personal privacy and personal data and, uh, and the accumulation of that data to sell us things back that we want or to sell advertising to us or whatever. And we could get into that whole debate. But I think, you know, the, the, uh, the, that, that is a, an area of, of considerable concern, which is only going to get worse as time goes by, without, uh, which consumers, on the whole, are always willing to run blindly into as long as services are offered for free. Yeah. I mean, it's quite, it is quite incredible that we have one of the largest companies in the world in Google with one of the most biggest profit lines in the world. Uh, and, you know, fundamentally, we all think that Google runs something for free. Yeah, uh, uh, but clearly, you know, that is not what the business prop model is, and that is not what we're doing there. We are adding value on a daily basis every single time we do a search. So I think that that that's that sits there as an enormous kind of uh, uh, thicket of complexity that we're going to get into. And at the same time, actually, for music consumers and music fans right now, I, we have incredible diversity. We have an amazing array of different sorts of uh, ways of consuming music and ways of engaging with our artists, and whether it's on the live side or whether it's on the recorded side or whether it's through streaming or whether it's through downloads or whether it's through community. And uh, actually, I think it's, it's really rich and it's really exciting. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, just w I just want to see that continue to grow because I think there's all kinds of cool stuff that's going to happen. Exactly, and, and going on the other end of the spectrum when we're look in, looking at uh, uh, crowdfunded and the direct fan initiatives, we've seen a, a big growth uh, of those companies, you know, uh, you're on the ch uh, channel on, on Music Glue, and also, you know, we've seen the growth of Pledge Music uh, and, of course, Kickstarter, but not so much on the music front. And uh, one question that I've been asking myself, and uh, I think you also address in the book, is uh, a question around scale. So uh, we're seeing these services grow. There's still a very small portion of the 
the recorded music industry's revenues, for example. Uh, do you feel like the services have uh, enough of our own way to become, and, and the consumers are interested enough in music to shift en masse to uh, crowdfunded or, or direct-to-consumer uh, offerings, or do they have a limited scope? Well, I think, I mean, there are two different things, right? So, so I mean, the whole crowdfunding um, model is... Uh, It doesn't doesn't necessarily have to relate to direct to fan. It's a sure. part of the yeah. direct to fan story. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, thinking about crowdfunding, I, I think the thing that's exciting about that is the way in which it drives creativity uh, right into the very act of selling. So, you know, the way that why does Kickstarter excite so many people? Why does Pledge Music work? It's not just because of the flavor of the music or the product. It's because of the whole package. It's because of the personality, the, the crazy zaniness of whatever it is that's being offered as a reward the color of the t-shirt, the logo, the fact that you get your name in the packaging, all of these things uh, are different triggers that, per, that encourage people to purchase. And actually, in terms of consumer marketing, that's much more creative uh, and much more engaging and much more about understanding that this is a conversation and a relationship that's starting um, than any of the conventional marketing that we've seen. And I think the thing that's really exciting about crowdfunding is the fact that you create a community in the process which doesn't then go away, but is actually vested in, interested in you, and continues to go with you, and, to, and that you can come back to. And, I, and, and that seems to me to be the thing that is really at the very heart of it. And it's, it's at the heart of D2C as well. Um, but in lots of ways, crowdfunding represents the kind of the apotheosis of that, like the best possible version of that, because now you've got not just a direct-to-fan communication, but actually you've got a conversation going on, yeah. and you, you're getting a response response and you're getting an interaction and I, that is where it's going to go that's that that seems to me to be such an attractive model and it's it's the, the it's what we've always felt i think you know when we get engaged with a band or an artist where we get seduced by that music we all individually feel that we've got some personal relationship with the artist it's just that historically we never did whereas right. now we re we really can so then i think the question is Is, and you asked this question, is it just going to be a niche or can that actually scale out more broadly? And that, I think, is the question that remains to be seen. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, it will come down to the skills of folks to be able to sustain that engagement. Um, but also there's a degree to which the more artists who are doing that, the less novel it becomes, the more extreme the enticements have to become. And it's hard to know whether that can be exhausted or whether that remains, uh, you know, endlessly inventive. Yeah. I mean, I certainly, if, if you go and spend time on Kickstarter and you start browsing around, it does in, start to feel more and more like a kind of exotic bizarre, you know, <laughs> yeah. like you're in some sort of like an Turkish <laughs> souk, you know, where, a digital souk, where you, you kind of have all these different blandishments. But after a while, maybe they all start to seem the same, because yeah. actually, you know, uh, so that's, I think that's, that's the question that's still an unknown. I don't, I don't know where that goes. But I, I think that the, uh, the, the development of that relationship and the two-way conversation between fans and artists, that, that is going to grow and grow, yeah. for sure. And uh, bringing the interview to a full circle, I wanted to ask you about, you know, uh, we've been talking about the, the middle ages uh, of, of digital and of, of digital music, especially. And so, uh, of course, uh, uh, looking at the historic metaphor, we can hopefully look forward to an era of uh, enlightenment, uh, but uh, God knows when that's going to come. Uh, so I wanted to ask, you know, uh, if that was to come around for you, what would it look like and what would be its main drivers? Well, I think, uh, you know, Uh, hopefully we can see some glimmers of it. So I think that, uh, you know, if you, if you take the, 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 the way in which high-definition audio, high-definition video, uh, holographic projections, uh, high granularity, high definition of, of transmission of content, it's going to get more and more exciting. And, you know, we are going to get to the place where every single performance by every single artist that ha happens live is going to be available online for you to stream into your home as a full-blown 3D experience in your living room if you want it. And, you know, obviously that will be really expensive to start off with, but I'm sure it'll get cheaper as time goes by. Uh, I think that the, 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 that driver for more and more immersive, more and more realistic, more and more all-encompassing experiences will be the thing that gives life to our content and life to our artists progressively. And in order to do that, 
uh, we will have to simplify licensing, and I think we will. I think we will see, uh, as time goes by, the pressure to bring the, li the rights together into bundles that are more easily managed and that will allow people to, to make licenses more quickly, more spontaneously, um, and across different sorts of, of uh, territories, territorial restrictions will start to, to become less important and so on. I think all of that will, are, the, are the things that we need to see in order to have this incredible kind of sense of, of all music in the flesh anywhere through through the kind of virtual reality and it's and uh, you know i mean i wrote about some of that in the book uh, and it's interesting to see that since then facebook acquired uh, uh, the rights to this virtual reality company yeah. um and uh, you know there's obviously something that's moving in that direction so we'll we'll see you can imagine in five years time we're going to be doing this show in front of a live uh, virtual audience uh, with our oculus rifts on our heads and uh, it's all going to be very exciting <laughs> 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 well, hopefully the Oculus Rift visor will have sort of shrunk to something that will become invisible. So we won't have to all go around looking like these super freaks, but, you know. Exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or in, be in our homes looking like super freaks to everybody else around us. And, uh, and well, Jeremy, it was uh, an absolute pleasure having you on. Uh, once again, uh, the book is uh, uh, Digital uh, Medieval, and uh, uh, you can find it on Amazon. Is it available internationally, I would assume? On Amazon, on iTunes, on Music Glue. Awesome. And of course, uh, uh, you yeah, just type Digital Medieval or uh, Jeremy Silver on uh, one of those services and you'll find it. You can also find a link to it uh, into the, in the recommended tab uh, on Digital Music Trends. And there's a little Amazon store there and you'll find the link straight uh, to the Kindle edition. It's also, is it uh, digital only at the moment? No, no, you can buy a paperback. Oh, you can wow. Buy awesome. A physical, physical thing and make notes. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome so so fantastic you can go and get that I actually really like to have industry books uh, in paper which is kind of weird I, I'm pretty happy to have fiction books uh, on a Kindle but if it's a sort of industry thing I, I like to have them on paper because then I can reference back and make notes and all that kind of stuff it, it makes it a lot more exciting and also it looks nice on the bookshelf you know you have a nice digital music section uh, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> I love to have uh, old school like that. Uh, well, Jeremy, once again, thanks so much. Uh, Jeremy, you can find Jeremy on uh, Jeremy S1 on Twitter, his handle, and uh, uh, anywhere else that people should look for you. Uh, MediaClarity.com. Perfect. Uh, so that's MediaClarity.com. Thanks so much. If you enjoyed watching or listening to the show and would like to find more, head on to DigitalMusicTrends.com. <laughs>